Welcome everybody to the second event in our 2022-2023 Virtual Scholarly Seminar series titled Surviving the Long Wars. We're getting a little bit of a late start today as we've had some tech hijinks and so we apologize for the delay and hope that you'll bear with us with any of the tech um, support needs that come up in the next several minutes. I also just want to note that we are recording today's conversation with Professor Kyle T. Mays and we'll make sure that that's posted to all of the Eventbrite uh, registrants as soon as possible. My name is Rona K. Kapadia. I'm an Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois Chicago, UIC, and one of the co-organizers of this series, along with my museum and exhibition studies colleagues, Therese Quinn and Aaron Hughes. By way of a visual description, I'm a late 30-something brown person with a beard and light green and tortoise-colored glasses and a crisp white dress shirt with polka dots in my home office on the northwest side of our city. We're gonna get started in just a few moments, but first an access invitation. We invite you to get comfortable in your space. Live captioning is available for this webinar. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click CC live transcript and then show subtitles. You can also access the captions in a separate stream text web browser window. We're dropping the link in the chat and we'll redrop it periodically throughout the session. After my opening remarks, the Oh, after my opening remarks, um, sorry, I'm having a little tech glitch on my end too. After my opening remarks, the chat will be turned off for attendees during the webinar as an access consideration for those folks using screen readers. Um, uh, but we will invite you to post comments and questions toward the end of today's conversation in the Q&A feature, which we will address as time permits. Although our focus today is on a moderated discussion with our speaker, Professor Kyle T. Mays, led by one of our NEH veteran artist fellows, Anthony Torres. If there are any other access needs, please post them in the Q&A and we will do our best to meet them in real time. Please note that we are recording today's webinar, as you know, and a digital archive of all of our seminar events will be made available on our website at a later date. Survivingthelongwars.online is our website which is also where you can join our mailing list to learn more about future events in the series, as well as the 2023 Veteran Art Triennial and Summit opening in next spring in Chicago. That's my cue to inform you to stay tuned for future events in our scholarly series, including a talk by Professor Lale Khalili of Queen Mary University of London on Thursday, November 10th. We will drop the Eventbrite information for that talk in the chat now as well, and you see it here on screen. So to start off today's event, while we are in virtual space together, we want to acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the Chicagoland area where the University of Illinois Chicago is based, the Three Fires Confederacy, the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe nations, as well as other tribal nations that know this area as their ancestral homelands, including the Menominee, the Ho-Chunk, the Miami, Peoria, and Sac and Fox, as well as their descendants, past present and emerging. Further, we acknowledge this land as the current home to one of the largest urban Native American communities in the United States. Native people are part of Chicago's past, present, and future. And finally, we are reminded that a land acknowledgement, especially by non-Native diasporic settler people of color like myself, should not just be some rhetorical gesture, but instead the animating force and material ground from which any critique of violence, imperialism, militarism, and warfare that we forward here today is made possible. To acknowledge is to act, and we encourage everybody to consider the multitude of ways to translate knowledge and thoughts into active support for indigenous peoples and communities locally, nationally, and around the world. So by way of introduction, we are a collective of scholars, curators, and artists at UIC working at the nexus of critical ethnic studies, feminist and queer studies, contemporary art and museum and exhibition studies. We've been collaborating for over a year on a national endowment for the humanities funded project. Surviving the Long Wars explores the multiple overlapping histories that shape our understanding of warfare, as well as the alternative visions of peace, healing and justice generated by diverse communities impacted by war. Our project attempts to visualize the parallels and intimacies between the two longest military conflicts in US history, the American Indian Wars of the 18th and 19th centuries and the 21st century global war on terror from the vantage point of contemporary black, indigenous and people of color or BIPOC veteran artists, as well as those most impacted by these wars. 
Today's talk by Professor Kyle Mays is the second in a virtual scholarly seminar series on new directions in comparative ethnic and native and indigenous studies on the histories and futures of native rebellion alongside contemporary US militarism and warfare. Our next talks are scheduled for Thursday, November 10th with Professor Lale Khalili, as I've mentioned, and then four talks in the spring 2023 semester, including with Harsha Walia, Nick Estes, Kelly Hayes and Tiffany King, respectively. The seminar series is part of a year long UIC graduate class and NEH Dialogues on the Experiences of War discussion program taught by veteran artist Aaron Hughes, which is exploring the legacies of US settler colonial military conflicts through the artistic practices and experiences of BIPOC veterans and those communities most impacted by these war regimes, including native and indigenous descendants and South and Southwest Asian and Muslim diaspora communities. Our entire project, as I've mentioned, cultimate, culminates in the second veteran art triennial and summit in spring 2023 at the Chicago Cultural Center, Hyde Park Art Center and Newberry Library. Throughout, we hope to spotlight new scholarship, forge innovative community collaborations, diminish silos in our interdisciplinary fields, and most importantly, highlight the role of art and culture in the historic and ongoing movement against militarization, war, and empire. Surviving the Long Wars is organized by Aaron Hughes, myself, Therese Quinn, Joseph Lefthand, Anthony Torres, and Amber Zora, with support from the University of Illinois Chicago Institute for the Humanities Innovation Grants, the UIC Award for Creative Activity, the Chicago Cultural Center, the Hyde Park Art Center, the Newberry Library, the D. Mill Art Fund, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Special thanks to Margaret Fink of the UIC Disability Cultural Center, Tal Foster of the Native American Support Program, and Zainab Hilal and Rachel Dukes, our amazing graduate assistants at UIC on this project as well, as, our, as well as our captioner today, Shari Cockman. It's now my pleasure to briefly introduce our moderator and NEH veteran artist fellow, Anthony Torres, who will be introducing our esteemed speaker, Kyle Mays, today. We'll also drop these bios into the chat feature as well. Anthony Torres is a writer, performer, and executive director of Combat Hippies, an ensemble of Puerto Rican military veteran performing artists based in Miami, Florida. He enlisted in active duty in the Army as a mental health specialist from 2002 to 2006. This included a 12 month combat tour to Abu Ghraib prison, Iraq, where he provided counseling to both deployed troops and Iraqi detainees. The Combat Hippies focuses on developing performances about combatants as people of color and shares experiences of veterans adjustments to life after war, as well as that of civilians from war torn countries. Their work also explores the search for meaning, purpose and identity through Puerto Rico's cultural and military heritage. Torres is currently a National Endowment for the Humanities Veteran Fellow and recipient of the DMO Art Fund for his work on the upcoming second Veteran Art Triennial and Summit in 2023. He's also a 2022 National Association of Latino Arts and Culture Leadership Fellow and a 2021 Kennedy Center Citizen Artist Fellow. Anthony, it's my pleasure to welcome you and please take it away. Thank you, Ronick. Uh, in reference to an image description, I am a 41 year old brown skinned male. My hair is in a top knot and I'm wearing a royal blue uh, collared shirt. Behind me is an all white bo uh, background here in my apartment. I'm honored to be here today as both an artist and NEH fel uh, veteran fellow to introduce our second scholarly seminar with Professor Kyle T. Mays. His work today, Indigenous Sovereignty, Black Freedom, Blackness, Indigeneity, and kinship as solidarity will be informative to understanding the connections and contradictions between the Indian wars and the global war on terror, specifically the way culture plays a role in resisting these forms of colonialism. As a fan of hip hop and an artist uh, working to explore the intersections of resistance to colonialism and the work of building solidarity, I'm excited to hear from Professor Mays. I believe hip hop is uh, a culture rooted in solidarity. It was built upon it. From the storytelling of rap to the physical expression of breaking by b-boys and b-girls through dance, hip hop culture has been a way to express the reality of what's happening in marginalized communities. It's been informative to both my practice and my thinking. 
I'm also interested in deepening my understanding of coalition building and how it can inform my work both on the stage and in the community. With that, I'm honored to introduce Professor Mays. Dr. Kyle T. Mays is an Afro-Indigenous Saginaw Chippewa writer and scholar of US history, urban studies, race relations, and contemporary popular culture. He is an associate professor of African-American studies, American Indian studies, and history at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is the author of City of Dispossessions, Indigenous Peoples, African-Americans, and the Creation of Modern Detroit, University of Pennsylvania Press, 2022, and Afro-Indigenous History of the United States, Beacon Press, 2021, and Hip Hop Beats, Indigenous Rhymes, Modernity, and Hip Hop in Indigenous North America, SUNY Press, 2018. His talk is titled Indigenous Sovereignty, Black Freedom, Blackness, Indigeneity, and Kinship as Solidarity. Welcome, Dr. Mays. Thank you, uh, Anthony, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, glad to be here with, with you all virtually. So I just have a PowerPoint I'm going to share. I'm going to talk for 30 minutes and then looking forward to a wonderful conversation. I apologize for the blurred thing. I'm in a hotel at a conference and um, this is the best scenario in which I could do this. So bear with me here and ignore what's going on in the background. So let's share this. Uh, so I'm going to put a timer on uh, my watch just in case. That's such a millennial thing to do. And go. So really two key questions undergird the work that I do and try to think about. And that is, what is the relationship between Black and Indigenous peoples? And this means in U.S. history, uh, in the contemporary, and going forward, so the future. Right. I'm a historian by training, but I always think we have to also use history to project and think about our future. The second question is simply this, and I'm paraphrasing my own words here, but what kind of world do we want to live in in the aftermath of settler colonialism and white supremacy? Right. Assuming we all think those are at worst bad things, uh, terrible things that happen in the world, assuming those things are bad. And we can't live in the world that um, subjugates Black and Indigenous peoples. Then we have to also think about building, right? And so I, I hope my contribution today and in some of the work that I do contributes to those particular struggles as well. So I think it's always important to locate yourself, describe your positionality in a certain way. And I'll do that very briefly, beginning with my great grandmother. So my great grandmother left the Saginaw Chippewa Reservation um, in 1940. Shortly thereafter, she married an African American man. Her name was Esther Shabus Mays, or Kadnaque was her indigenous name. She came. She was 16. Shortly thereafter, she married an African American man, and she became a well-respected elder uh, in the city of Detroit. So. She co-founded what was called Detroit's Indian Education and Cultural Center in 1974. And she is what I like to describe as an urban indigenous feminist. Now, what is that? They believe that native peoples have a future within the city. Now, it might seem odd to this crowd, but I always ask and remind people um, that the majority of indigenous peoples live in cities, right? So Chicago, LA, Wherever you live, the majority of Native peoples live in cities, and it's important to recognize that. That's not to dismiss the importance and the people who live on reservations, but a lot of us live in cities, right? And you grow up in cities, so you have a connection to all sorts of different people. And the work that in honoring, by using urban Indigenous feminists, honoring the unique work and struggles that uh, Indigenous women faced and continue to face within cities, right? They've been, they were leaders of the community dealing with sexism from native men, but yet they persisted and continued doing this uh, fantastic work for the future of native people. At the podium here is my Aunt Judy. So my Aunt Judy, my Aunt Judy Mays um, founded what was a third of her public school with a native American curriculum called Medicine Bear American Indian Academy. And that's my Aunt Linda holding up the bear. 
And what's important about these academy, which was created in the, um, it's a public school created in the 1990s, it was very much supported by black people, black council people, black politicians, and so forth throughout the city, because it was coming on the tail end of the Afrocentric, culturally relevant education movement in the city of Detroit. Uh, and so I meet activists who are activists today, artists, hip hop artists, and they go, do you know Judy Mays? And it's, it's, and I'm like, yeah, I've heard of Judy Mays. And like, is that a relative? And it's my aunt. So I'm, I'm glad about the work that she has put in, in the city. The school is no longer in operation, but it's important to acknowledge and show love to our elders. Uh, I don't think we do it enough, but we we definitely got to continue to raise them up and honor those legacies past uh, going and also going forward. So a few myths and assumptions that I write about, hear about, and giving talks, and I think it's important to confront some of those head on. Now, many of you here might know some of this information, but let's just, let's just talk about it very briefly. One of them, uh, I, I get this often. Um, for some of my some of my black folks, Native American tribes enslaved Africans. There were five tribes, the five tribes, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole, who enslaved Africans, right? So that's five. That's not the other four hundred and sixty-nine other other federally recognized tribes, those who aren't recognized and so forth, who did not actually enslave Africans. So let's keep that with the five tribes. And they have their own issues to deal with. The other sort of thing is people, Native people will say, what about the Buffalo soldiers? They committed acts of genocide against Native peoples on the plains, the Southwest, and in the Western uh, U.S. Absolutely, we should talk about the Buffalo soldiers. The 9th and 10th Cavalry formed after the uh, Civil War. But we have to also acknowledge, um, after 4 million people got their freedom outside of enslavement, what are their options, right? As convict leasing is increasing and incarcerating black men in particular, they're finding ways to find adventure, get some form of freedom. You get paid, although not paid paid well, but you get paid for this sort of labor. And they're also engaging in acts of genocide, right? So it's important to just acknowledge the context. One of my favorite sayings in African-American vernacular lore, you know, you got high cheekbones, you got that good hair, therefore you must have indigenous heritage. It's just not true, right? Um, just because you have these features, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have indigenous heritage. And even so, like DNA tests don't, are not a representative of you actually having indigenous heritage. It's about your cultural connection to people and community, right? So it's not only what you decide to claim, but who can claim you. And Black and Indigenous peoples have a shared identity rooted in oppression, certainly. So one of the things that's fundamental to my own work um, and activism, writing, thinking, is that the enslavement of people of African descent and the dispossession or expropriation of Indigenous land is foundational to U.S. democracy. Let me say that again. The dispossession of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of African peoples was foundational to U.S. democracy and their afterlives have been foundational to the United States' identity, politically, economic, cultural, et cetera, right? It's, it's foundational. Uh, the wealth built by the country, um, the identity of the country, American exceptionalism, all those things are tied up uh, into the things that happen and continue to happen to black and indigenous peoples. All right, so we got some of those high points around black and native history and intersections. And finally, and I'll end the talk uh, with this, black and native peoples are not natural allies. Black and native peoples are not natural allies. I think that's just important to say. And I'm saying that for a particular reason, which I'll end the talk with, but remember that. No oppressed peoples are natural allies, no matter if the source or the cause of their oppression originate with the same sort of systems. So dispossession, um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but I, I prefer dispossession uh, sometimes over settler colonialism. Now settler colonialism is simply, you have people from a foreign land coming over, taking land, 
taking resources, displacing and removing people, and then creating a new idea of what that place is supposed to be. But importantly, it's also narratives and symbols. It's signs. It's how people talk and discuss about who belongs and who does not. Now, I live in uh, Los Angeles, and we see the logics of uh, dispossession existing in many places, many areas. So whether that's the notion of mass, the issue of mass incarceration, um, whether that's the the uh, gentrification and removal of poor people, of unhoused peoples, these are all examples of modern uh, examples of dispossession, right? And think about the textbooks that you had. That's why I say narratives, both what's said and what isn't said. Right. A whole thing about settler colonialism and dispossession is to tell people that native peoples no longer exist. And you have to continue to justify that through narratives, through popular culture, through textbooks. For example, two questions real quick. If I ask all of you to name me 10 famous indigenous peoples. It might take you a while. If I ask you to name me 10 well known famous African Americans. Might take you a minute, but I'm sure you could do that much quicker, right? Or if I ask you, think about the place where you grew up, and it really doesn't matter, it could be all over the world. What do you know about the indigenous peoples? Are they still there, right? Think about that. This is how colonialism works. And that could be in South Africa, um, that could be in Taiwan, I mean, Mexico, it could be all sorts of places where they're indigenous peoples, but they're very much erased. So settler colonialism is not just a U.S. project, it's a global phenomenon. And as I said, a key point, key takeaway, of course, indigenous dispossession and African enslavement are foundational to U.S. democracy. I don't, I don't know how, any other way to say that. But let's go to the Black and Red Power era. Now, typically, we consider the Black and Red Power era a moment of what I like to call impossibilities. So there are possibilities and some things that didn't seem possible. People thought the world was fundamentally changing. They believed that things were going to be in their favor, that land might be returned to native peoples, that capitalism might end, there would be a worldwide revolution. In retrospect, um, they had a right to think about that, but it didn't happen, of course. Capitalists, um, oppressors learn very quickly how to navigate um, and to destroy movements and, and undermine movements very well. But, and this is for the Black Matter Power Movement, we're talking about the period roughly from 1966 to perhaps 1978. So the formation of the Black Panther Party, the formation of the American Indian Movement, when Stokely Carmichael is saying, um, is declaring black power in Greenwood, Mississippi in June 1966. And when native peoples are finding various ways to struggle against oppression and talking about returning land and so forth. So, but back to the point I made earlier about uh, solidarity. So this is Vine Deloria Jr. writing initially and uh, this book originally came out in 1978, Behind the Trail of Broken Treaties. And Deloria says, minority groups are often astounded to learn that the Indians are not planning to share the continent with their oppressed brothers once the revolution was over. Hell no. The Indians are planning on taking the continent back and kicking out all the Black, Chicano, Anglo, and Asian brothers who have made the whole thing possible. This might seem kind of jarring, but you have to understand the context in which uh, Deloria is writing and also the invisibility that indigenous peoples experience during the time and continue to experience, right? They continue to be marginalized. And so Deloria, and I think it's important to say, is centering land, right? Land. Land is a key component of liberation if we're in the U.S. So one, one, another example is the Republic of New Africa and the notion of land. So they reason um, in what they called the Malcolm X Action formed in Detroit in 1968, that they should get the five Southern states as reparations for slavery. And the United States 
should pay them upwards of five hundred um, uh, million dollars for reparations for slavery. Actually, I think it's five hundred billion, even in nineteen sixty-eight. Uh, and but the question is, and they use a lot of Cherokee removal, five tribes removal history, but is it just and returning land? or acquiring land, where do you, what do you do with, with indigenous peoples, right? If this is a, a historical theoretical question, but it's also, you know, a, land has been a major part of uh, black discourse, ideas of black politics, owning land, number 40 acres and a mule, which my colleague, Elena Roberts, uh, whose book, I've been here all the while, Black Freedom on Native Land talks about beautifully uh, and the notion of 40 acres and a mule, right? Some black people actually did get 40 acres and a mule, but it's still the question of indigenous land. But black and red power. Now, while there might have been differences for some organizations, perhaps there were some shared values. And I think in some ways you're talking about returning land. Um, you're talking in terms of being anti-capitalist. Right. Native people simply wanted the U.S. to honor treaties, and the U.S. has violated every treaty they've ever made on Native people. They're both critiques of the U.S. nation state. Black people are trying to find self-determination. So all these things are essentially shared ideological values. And some people did, in fact, overlap, although it certainly was not a lot of people. It was some people who did interact. Perhaps one of the most important ones here was Stokely Carmichael. Now, we all know Stokely Carmichael who changed his name to Kwame Ture, deeply influ influenced by the work of Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Ture. And he said this, which is profound for the time and even today. Anybody who thinks seriously about working on behalf of the Redmen must deal with this truth. The land on which we live and which we inhabit which we exploit, that land belongs to the red man. He must come first in any dealings with the land. Now, the key thing here, he's centering land. He's telling uh, black people, while he's saying, like, and trying to articulate this notion of pan-Africanism, of, uh, of how we belong, he's challenging uh, black folks in particular. And we might also say other people of color as well, but black folks in particular here. And there was a, a lot of black people in this audience uh, from, from the photos that I've seen. He's saying, what if we center land, right? And any, any of our analysis of ending oppression, what if we center land? And that would, should fundamentally change our perspective on the connection between black liberation and indigenous sovereignty, right? So you had this, this slide earlier where Vine Deloria is like, hell no, we're kicking people out. But yeah, Stokely explicitly saying, and this changed significantly. So someone asked him around 1968, 69, where should black people go? And he's like, their land is African, which is idealistic in some ways, um, but that was part of his ideology of Pan-Africanism, right? But again, centering land, if we're talking about the US, has to be kind of central. So I want to uh, spend the remainder of the talk talking about reparations, land back, and justice. Now, in, in some principal ways, I do support reparations for uh, African Americans. For instance, the uh, Manhattan Beach, which was uh, Bruce's Beach, taken from a Black couple who had owned plots of land that was very wealthy in 1927. The city council just said, hey, you know, y'all know how settlers do. This is our land now and, and just took it away from them. Uh, and it was returned back to the family as of, I believe, September of this year. Uh, and it's, it's been a long time in the making. And the articles I've read talk about the history of the beach. And a few of them will mention very briefly that this was Tonga land. So Tonga Gabrielino or the uh, one of the indigenous nations within Southern California, or or LA in particular. And that'll be a first sentence, the LA Times had an article like that. But they fail to remember that this is native land, right? 
And so the Bruce family absolutely deserves compensation and a return of that land, which has happened. But again, where do indigenous peoples fit in this idea of land back, of justice? And I'm going to keep pressing, and I think that's an important point, and it's a hard point to really deal with, right? If you center land, you have to come deal with real uh, questions and issues that are uncomfortable for many of us. And one of the one of the key things, at least ideologically, in an activist circles, um, is a, a statement like this. But more broadly speaking, when Black people are free, all people are free. And while the Kambahi River Collective had fantastic um, notions of um, solidarity with other women of color, other um, socialist groups. And, and mostly a rejection of uh, white feminism and even white lesbian circles who were just anti-man. Um, and they were like, well, these people are in our community, right? So I think while they engage in an act of solidarity, I think some people assert when black people are free, all people will be free. But again, that doesn't necessarily deal with the question of land. Right, and so uh, one of my favorite thinkers, Leanne Simpson, says in the aftermath of uh, the Ferguson uprising in 2015, I have responsibility to make space on my land for those communities of struggles to center and amplify black voices and to co-resist, right? And I think that's, that's kind of where we need to go. That's what Kwame Ture believed as a black person, activist back in the day, um, I'm sure the black queer socialist women in the Kamati River Collective statement would probably agree with this. Never asked anyone directly, but I'm, I'm sure if they thought about it, that would definitely be a part of that. But it has to be when black and indigenous people are free, all people will be free, right? That It's kind of, you have to have the land part and you can't just dismiss indigenous peoples in that analysis. Um, so people doing the work today. So the Indian Collective, uh, which I've done some work with and they remain, they continue to do fantastic things. So the US is, whether you wanna call it acquired through treaty, sea, stolen 1.5 billion acres. And then, so they argue to truly dismantle white supremacy and systems of oppression, we have to go back to the roots, which for us is putting indigenous lands back in indigenous hands. And they articulate land back as a political framework, which I think is a brilliant move, right? Again, we're centering the land here. And they say it allows us to deepen our relationships across the field of organizing movements, working toward true collective liberation because they're invested in the liberation of black people, of um, all sorts of people of color as well, different oppressed groups, right? But again, it's centering the land and centering indigenous peoples in that analysis. Right. And I think this is truly brilliant on their part. Now, reparations. Again, as I said earlier, in theory, I support reparations, but the key question for me, and as Kirsten Mullen and William Darity articulate here, 15 to $20 trillion. Now, do we think the United States government is, is given? No, they're not. They barely gave, uh, you know, people who needed that during the ongoing COVID crisis, but the early times. Uh, money for to live. They didn't want to give that out. And they barely gave enough to people to to survive. Are they going to give this money for reparations? They have given reparations uh, in some capacity before uh, to those who suffered under um, Japanese internment. But they're not going to give 15 to 20 trillion dollars. Right. And so the key question for me and why I think these things should be conjoined, why can't we have a joint conversation between Black and Indigenous uh, reparations? Why can't we conjoin those particular two? Towards what I call the aftermath of settler colonialism and white supremacy and why solidarity is important. So um, my colleague and good friend, Amber Starks, uh, who goes by Melanie Muskogee, on social media says, I fundamentally believe our arrival at black liberation and indigenous sovereignty 
will certainly require us to remember who we are outside of our oppressors, institutions, ideologies, and imaginations. And, for, and to me, that's powerful. It takes a lot of work, as uh, the artists uh, who are on here know, to imagine a future, but we have to do the work of imagining, right? I'm thinking here of uh, Professor Robin E.G. Kelly, my colleague at UCLA, his work on freedom dreams, right? You have to dream of freedoms and dream up notions of liberation, right? There's a lot of power in the imagination and in creativity, which is why, uh, at least for me, Indigenous hip hop artists who are out here doing the work um, as cultural workers, activists, producing music, trying to get us, us to really think very clearly about not only our present, but what kind of future do we have, do we desire? And for me, I think kinship is essential. So I want to return back to um, no one is a natural ally. So Audre Lorde in an essay, Learning from the 60s, says that any future vision which can encompass all of us by definition must be complex and expanding, not easy to achieve. Right, I think that that part, I don't think we spend enough time on. Liberation is not something that's easy to achieve. And it's not simply for the fact that uh, the those in power will not just give up power, right? Obviously we know that, but to connect with one another takes a lot of effort, time and energy. You have to be willing to spend the time. So for, you know, black and native folks and other people of color get together you know, do it over some food and really learn about each other's histories, read things together, watch things together, listen to things together and do it multi-generational. So we can so easily forget on one end our elders and on the other end our youth, our adolescents, our children, right? You have to have multiple generations and people have to have equal voice in thinking through some of these things. Um, I'll, I just have four minutes here. And I think one thing that people could do, especially indigenous nations, one of the most sovereign things you could do is adopt whatever their protocols are. So on the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, we have a, a clan system, at least historically, and you relate it to people by your clan. And eventually they created a clan for those who were deemed outsiders, right? Who were adopted in. And whatever those protocols are for different nations, like, why can't we figure out ways to include people into our territories as Leanne Simpson articulated? So um, I'm going to end here. And this is a, um, this is the track by Superman who's been doing fantastic hip hop here. I'll play this video and then I'll, uh, after it's done, I'll end here. But it's really for me thinking about the future. Let me make sure I share sound real quick. I'll just forget that part. ชอดาคะเฮอินาบาเบอีซุกุสซาดิสซิลลาดิสซิบาชอกาลาลอบะลาจาเวอาเกมาจลาซุเปอร์แมนฮุกซุเปอร์แมนบาเบอะลาโก
Dagwa, the Shiptala, Giluk the Lak, Oak Chiptala. in there but i just think it's so dope uh to think about futurism but also going back in the past and trying to change to 1491 of course it's a reference to um uh to the year before uh columbus began his his genocidal act so chimi gwitcher thank you very much um and i'm looking forward to the discussion Um, Professor Mays, thank you so much. Um, that was packed with tons of, of information and history. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, oh, I'm, oh, I also just want to share that I'm, I'm a fan of Superman and I, I just watched that video recently. It was just released last year. Um, uh, so I, uh, I wanted to start by asking you a question that you actually asked uh, in an interview uh, that you, you gave with the National Museum of the American Indian with two native uh, hip hop artists. Uh, when did you fall in love with hip hop? Who introduced you to it? And how has hip hop shaped or informed your perspective on blackness, indigeneity, and solidarity? It's from my older brother, actually. So, you know, 
we had like a kind of unfinished basement and he was down there kind of doing his own thing. But he would, um, I remember he was listening to, uh, he's listening to, um, I'm blanking on, um, uh, Biggie, 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 can't you see? Hypnotize. There you go. Mm-hmm. So he's listening to Hypnotize. And I'm just, I'm like 10 at the time, but it was, it really just was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, let me go and listen. And my mom wasn't allowing me to listen to some of this stuff, but my brother always like, let me sneak in and listen to some of the stuff. And my brother was also um, deeply influenced by um, issues of, cause he drummed. I never, I would never went drumming. So I was always fascinated also with like native hip hop, music and so forth. So his between the drumming, um, going to powwows as a kid, this is the problem of being in a hotel. Someone's knocking on the door too. Uh, anyways, um, so, and I was curious to like how people actually navigated and how he learned uh, sort of those things. So hip hop has been influential in some of the stuff that how I think about it influences how I write. If I'm writing, if I'm writing now, I'm sorry, I'm uh, busy right now. Busy, yes, thank you. Shout out to housekeeping though, I love all the workers. You gotta respect the workers. Um, So, between uh, Biggie, I remember uh, listening to Naughty by Nature. I had no idea, uh, you down with OPP, I did not really realize what that meant until much later (laughs) in life. But I remember just like kind of rapping as a kid and my brother like laughing at me, but yeah, it was pretty influential. When I'm writing, I I have hip hop on. It's not classical music. It gives me kind of a flow. So it meant something and it still means a lot to me to uh, be able to utilize hip hop. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I feel like hip hop as a culture from folks who, you know, who it resonates with feel like they're, you know, they're a part of the culture, but I, I feel sometimes that uh, folks outside of that don't, don't really acknowledge it. They just pretty much only see music and not really that, you know, it incorporates so much from dance to language, um, you know, so many different components. Uh, um, and what I've always appreciated about it. Oh, what's that? She really wants to clean the room. <laughs> I, I'm here for it, and, uh, you know, but we got business to take care of. Yes, yes. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in your work that uh, coalition building is not easy and that solidarity is hard work. Uh, poet Aja Monet was recently a guest on Talib Kweli's People's Party podcast, mm-hmm. where she shared um, that ra- radical solidarity requires an understanding that my oppression is tied to yours. And you, you've mentioned that in, in, in your talk today. Um, how might you suggest that that ties back to the work of, of BIPOC veteran artists and activists in, in that community and sharing work um, that speaks to colonialism um, and resistance? Yeah, I mean, I think the old school, um, you know, those, those veterans from back in the day I, I think one of the key differences, they thought like the world was fundamentally changing. They really thought revolution was happening. And because of that, they were like, we need to get as many people on board as possible. Of course, there were divisions. It was never um, something that was set in stone. But for those who engaged in acts of solidarity, they really thought the world was fundamentally changing. And I think now because of how capitalism works, uh, how the state knows how to engage activism, like you have to get a permit to march, things like that, which is like the antithesis of of like action, right? Um, It's hard to think of imaginations. And this is where the like the creative artistic folks come in because they offer a sort of anti-colonial critique of 
both of a measuring solidarity, but also critiques of the state in a way that sometimes isn't very clear and sometimes very much more clear. Like Superman in this video, basically talking about indigenous futures and um, what we can learn from the past. So I think we still need to study a lot more. And I know younger younger folks than me, uh, my students always get upset at me about this. So I'm like, you really have to study history uh, and the social conditions that you live in today. Because if you don't have, you know, at least a few very clear analysis of the problem, because a lot of people are like, let's just act. And I'm like, but sometimes you have to show up with people if it's solidarity, when there's something you don't quite get, but you know, like, this is something that bothers these people, or this is how they're oppressed. Let me show up because it's the right thing to do. Not necessarily always because you get something out of it. Right. And learning takes time. So learn patience. Like you might not understand what they're facing, but and you also have to hang out with people. So one of the favorite things I always hear or questions, it's not a favorite, but it's a common question from um, white people in particular. And they go, what, how can I be an ally or an accomplice? And I'm like, well, first of all, you need to hang out with people. Right? I'm like, you know what John Brown did, which was wild, even in the 19th century. He he would stay in towns that it was like full of black people. Right. If you don't have true solidarity or kinship with people, which is another part, some sort of family. Because solidarity is pretty fleeting. But if I see you as a, as a sibling, as a cousin, whatever, then. I'm going to do all that I can. And not that you always agree with family, obviously, but I'm going to do all that I can to move forward in a good way with you. That's why I think kinship is so important. Um, yeah, you know, in, in, in that interview, which is amazing, I don't know if you've, you've had a chance to see it, but I, I recommend it for everyone. Uh, it was very insightful. She mentioned these, these exact things. She mentioned uh, that li how important listening is in solidarity and also acknowledging um, the different privileges that, that we might have in, in the space. Um, my current theater piece is, is entitled Amal, which is Arabic for hope. And we reference hope uh, both literally and figuratively throughout the performance. Um, at times during production for this show, the show premiered in 2019. So we're talking like 2017, 2018. Um, we really struggled within my theater company with feeling hopeful and then sh trying to translate that in our work. Um, and this was on the heels of the Trump presidency, the mm -hmm. protests against police brutality across the country and the impact of Hurricane Maria on Puerto Rico. Um, as a historian and intellectual, knowing all that you do uh, about uh, our collective past in this country and where we are today in society, where do you find your hope? Sheesh, do I even have hope? Uh, I have some hope, I have some hope. Uh, I mean, one of the things that um, oppress people around the world in the US, uh, the reason you have hope is because you know of a history in which people, you know, there was various, you know, we might say small oppression. And I, I don't, I'm not belittling oppression, but things prior to colonization, uh, prior to like the capitalism that we have to live under now. There was a world in which it existed where people had some version of freedom, right? It looked different because it's a different, you know, way, way back in the day. And you also look at uh, more recent historical figures who always struggle. Because when people struggle, that's that's what gives me hope. Trying to figure things out, um, in 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 spite of the ongoing assaults that happen against uh, oppressed peoples, people continuing to struggle, continuing to create out of pain, out of suffering. That's for me. That's that's the hope, and that's that's not good, of course. But that's just what we have to do to survive. Right. I think when people continue to struggle and organize and come together, um, 
that's that's the beauty of of solidarity right coming together and continuing to struggle and say we're going to continue living and resisting no matter what um it's uh you you mentioned uh the buffalo soldiers earlier and uh it's it's such a complicated topic to explore yeah. the experience of BIPOC service members uh, from the, the Navajo code talkers of World War I to the Tuskegee Airmen World War II, the mm -hmm. Borinqueneers and all Puerto Rican unit during the Korean War. Uh, BIPOC community members continue to join the military in large numbers. Uh, you mentioned how you, you plan to, uh, you, ha you had planned to uh, maybe write write about Buffalo Soldiers um, in, in your book. Um, for those who don't know, and this was an all black uh, cavalry regiment in the US Army, um, as you mentioned earlier, who fought against uh, native tribes. Uh, with, with this in mind, I want to ask two questions. Uh, what's your view on this history and the continued legacy of BIPOC involvement in, in US led wars? And for BIPOC veteran artists like myself, people who've been in the system, um, what are your thoughts on how our work might contribute to resisting colonialism and showing up in solidarity with the communities that were formed? Yeah, I mean, um, even the history of the Buffalo Soldiers. So, you know, so people are out there and they're like doing some of these things, but they begin to question, right? And because from my understanding, like for instance, when you had native people joining the military, they had their own reasons. Some of them were like, well, we're doing this because this is on native land. Some people are like, I need to get out the reservation. I need to see some adventure. I don't have any money. There's economic reasons for joining. And you think like, oh, I'll be able to better myself in some way. And also let's not the military industrial complex actively recruits uh, black and brown and indigenous peoples. Right? I mean, I, one of my aunties, um, uh, what like a family member I remember trying to recruit me to the military and I was like I'm going to school I don't need to go to the military I'm going to school uh, but a lot of young men young people they just get kind of recruited and it's just a hard thing to to get out of it and the wars of aggression of colonialism there are many instances where people are engaged in those sorts of struggles but once they're there they realize this isn't this isn't, this ain't it. <laughs> they literally, like, this ain't it. And the U.S. still having the biggest military footprint in the world, too. Um, it's how it continues to maintain power over over us in the, in the U.S. and certainly colonized peoples um, around the world. So the role, I think, that... Um, vets like yourself and other people can do is to continue getting people to think critically about U.S. empire and U.S. exceptionalism, right? Because it's one thing to criticize the media, but a lot of people don't know like all the negative things that they're doing until they're there. So how do we get our young people before they go over there to think, well, why, am, why are we even at war? I didn't, I didn't want to go to war. I didn't sign up for this. My tax dollars didn't want to go to this. You know, the old, the, uh, the Iraq war. Why are we looking for weapons of mass destruction? Right? Why are we in giving billions of dollars to Ukraine, for example? Right? And, and, and indirectly giving military um, and those sort of things to, to dictators and other people around the world, right? So we got to get people to think more critically about uh, the military industrial complex. And, you know, that's the work of folks like you and other folks. Um, but it's important because ever since 9-11, uh, being critical of the military gets people in a lot of trouble, but it still needs to be critiqued. You can't spread, I'm sorry, you can't spread democracy through war. Just, this is not how that works. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to check in on time if maybe one or two more questions was okay. Um, Sounds good, Anthony. One, maybe oh, one okay. more. Come on. 
Maybe one more, okay. Um, if that's the case, I wanted to reference uh, uh, how you opened your, your talk today um, by highlighting or sharing your family history and the, the uh, women elders in your family. Um, in your work, you've, you've mentioned how indigenous women are two and a half times more likely to be sexually assaulted than any other um, ethnic or racial groups. How can we raise awareness about missing and murdered indigenous women um, and this crisis? And, and what can we learn from history? Yeah, I mean, there's um, it, it, one of the things about how colonization works, it, it goes hand in hand. You, you take the land and you also find ways to um, exploit and degrade the relationships between people in, um, in indigenous communities. And sexual assault is a major part of, um, of how settler colonialism and dispossession works, right? So you have to change religious structures, gender structures, uh, and then commit various acts of violence against um, queer people, trans folks, native women and so forth. So it really goes hand in hand, right? And I think one of the things that a lot of um, cis hetero native men and so forth is to continue to push and challenge uh, colonial patriarchy, right? Bell Hooks is always on point with this, shout out to the uh, late great Bell Hooks about critiquing cis hetero normative uh, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Because if, you, if we don't do that, you reproduce the same issues as well. So we're culpable in some of that. Um, by we, I mean cis hetero men and in, 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 in acting and doing the work of colonialism. Thank you for that. Uh, I've just been watching a string of her talks. She did this series with the New School and I've been watching that recently and wrote down those terms because she also shared that we need to deepen, if, if we're gonna take action, um, that we need to deepen our understanding of those of those topics of, of patriarchy, of colonialism, right. of capitalism. So um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, it's, it's about the future. So I, I think it's fitting. Um, you, you've shared that you, you can't have justice in a state built on enslavement and dispossession of indigenous land until something new emerges. Uh, with that in mind, I wanted to ask you about what role artists play in envisioning alternative futures bringing to life the freedom dreams referenced by uh, uh, Robert B.G. Kelly and uh, something you've mentioned in several of your talks uh, is Nina Simone's definition of freedom. Uh, yeah. Shout out to Nina Simone. Um, so this this clip, it's, uh, it's on the documentary. Um, I think it's still on. Um, on Netflix actually, but someone asked her what does freedom mean to her? And she paused, kind of said a few things. And she said, freedom is no fear, right? And so I use that to say, what if we can live? And, and she goes on to talk about how when she, the one of the few times she felt free is playing on stage. And you can see, like if you listen and watch some old school Aretha Franklin or the um, gospel documentary that came out, she had the church um, in LA, if you look at a great jazz musician and you see like they're there, but they're not like, they're somewhere else because they're so into, they're free for a moment, they're free. And this is the role artists have. They, they create the sound, they create the visuals um, and the, the imagination of the freedom that we know we need, but can't articulate. Right. And so this is the role of the artist, creating those areas of, of freedom that we know we need, but can't quite articulate simply in, uh, in language. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work and, uh, and, and, and all that you do in, in, in sharing it and informing folks and changing perspectives. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Kyle. What a beautiful discussion between the two of you. And thank you, Kyle, for laying down so much, I think, really foundational and important work to getting us to think about 
the contradictions and complexity of what we mean by solidarity in all these ways that have really uh, borne through in all of your works. I just want to name a couple of things that are happening in the Q and A, um, just to lift up and say that there's lots of lots of praise and and thank yous. Of course, I also want to let everyone know who's still with us in the webinar that we are recording this, as you know, and this we will make sure that this gets posted to our website. And we apologize for the late start and some of the hiccups around tech as we were getting going. Um, Tal Foster of the UIC Native American Support Group is asking, I think, an important and provocative question, which is why are urban universities like UIC, why have they abandoned Native American studies courses, even while being home to over 60,000 Native peoples in Cook County? This is a question I think many of us are asking here at UIC. And one of our goals, of course, with this project is to sort of cultivate and vivify space for Native studies and comparative ethnic studies on our campus. And so I'm curious, Kyle, if you want to say something about that, I'll just name a couple other things that are happening in the chat. Um, there's folks are uh, bringing up questions around the disability justice movement in relationship to hip hop and the foundational work of Leroy Moore, which I imagine, Kyle, I'm sure you're familiar with of Crip Hop Nation and the work that's happening at UCLA. Um, so folks are, are, are naming that and some other organizing and social movement work that's happening right now. And then somebody, an anonymous um, person has asked as an Afro indigenous person, to, um, they've yet to find an Afro indigenous woman who's yet to find solidarity with other brown folks. How can black indigenous and other brown folks get together when anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity is the focus globally? And I think this is a nice segue to also name that one of the things that we're trying to think through in this project, we're using the language of BIPOC in a kind of aspirational way as a coalitional category, of course, to center black and indigenous peoples. Uh, but the project is also looking at the intimacies, the strange affinities across those US Indian wars of the 18th and 19th century. And as you've already alluded to the 21st century global war on terror. And uh, Kyle, you, you named so much stuff about the kind of post 9-11 way in which people think about US empire and exceptionalism, but you know, how do Arabs and Muslims and South Asians and Latinx people fit into this paradigm? And how do we think both the centrality of anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity that pervades and permeates U.S. war culture, popular culture, everything that is crucial to the settler colony that we're living in. But how do we also think through the complexity of those other communities of color that are grappling with, you know, the legacies of violence and warfare, including our contemporary wars? So I know that's a lot of heavy stuff, but <laughs> I think part of what Anthony here is representing is that a lot of the NEH fellows who are going to be making new art and performance for our curatorial exhibitions in the spring with this veteran art. Uh, triennial is we're trying to center BIPOC veterans because they have a kind of complex twin relationship in which to pro appreciate and think through U.S. empire, but we're trying to put their work in conversation with Black and Native artists, Arab, Muslim, South Asian, Muslim artists, right, who are also bringing, you know, new ways of thinking about these wars. So with that bigger frame about the intimacies across those two wars, how are you thinking about that in relationship to these questions of solidarity that you've approach for us? Yeah, so um, real quick to the question of why universities and urban. So first of all, uh, I don't, I can't remember if I mentioned this at all, but the majority of Native people live in cities, right? A lot of universities and just general people just don't know this. And they think I need to go on some reservation that's very far away. And shout out to them if you decide to do that. You can also go strictly to Chicago. There's a long-standing, as you all know here, there's a long-standing urban Indian center um, community that has been there for a long time. And you can connect with them. You can try to recruit those kids, but you also need Native faculty and staff. Although I'm not someone that just thinks you have representation, therefore at least a decolonization and solves all the issues, because it doesn't. Like I like to remind people there is Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court and some of y'all had Obama as a president and did it change the social and political and economic conditions of the most vulnerable people in the black community? Obviously not, right? But you had representation. Anyways, um, so working within that local community and it's just native uh, people, values, ideas are not seen as valuable because then the university has to think critically, like we're on this native land, let's get a land acknowledgement though, right? We know how trash the universities in general are about that. They're like, 
UCLA took them years to just like, well, we have to make sure we're not acknowledging that we're returning this land. They took all this, and I'm like, it's just a way to acknowledge it. It's not that deep. And they barely wanted to do that. If that says anything about how they treat uh, Native people and issues in the academy. Um, and we need more work still on urban, what I call urban indigenous studies, right? I think that's, if we have more of that, which is kind of the work that I try to do um, in addition to this work, if you have a lot more focus on those studies, I think it'll go a long way into convincing universities to focus on that. But um, so solidarity, you have to find people also, I, the reason I say we're not natural allies is I start with that assumption, right? And just because you're black, indigenous, brown, I don't assume they're for sure the same ideology. Do you critique capitalism as a foundational part of your ideology, right? For me, that's important. Do you think native people should have land? Do you think white supremacy has negative consequences? or colonialism has negative consequences. And for me, those are kind of the three things that are important to me ideologically. You might be white, black, brown, indigenous. If we share those values, you are my kin now. If you don't share those values, I don't care if you're black, indigenous or whatever. Not all skin folk is kin folk, right? So assuming that we're not natural allies, you have to find the people that you vibe with ideologically. Because if you don't, you're gonna to continue to be disappointed and frustrated, you know, when a celebrity does something, when someone you're cool with says something anti-black or anti-indigenous. I try not to be surprised. I'm like, well, like so I think someone mentioned somewhere in the chat about the uh like the wild things happening in in LA on the city council. Most people, they know what goes on in their communities. Right, but you have to challenge it. I appreciate that. Absolutely, you know the politics of recognition and um, uh, belonging only goes so far. And you know, finding kin who share our critiques of power and violence. I think that's mm -hmm. capitalism or empire or cis heteropatriarchy, as you and Anthony mm -hmm. were talking about, is really the is the work. Um, and I think that's part of what we're trying to shine a light, light on here as well. And Anthony, I, I don't know if there's other things that are coming to mind for you or questions. We have a couple more minutes for sure. And I know there's other folks dropping stuff in the Q&A and sticking with us, but Anthony, I want to turn things off to you. Um, I, you know, I had a, <laughs> this could be a really long part of the discussion, but I just wanted to mention how, you know, the protests against uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, I was watching from way down here in South Florida back in 2016. And I saw these calls for veterans to go to Standing Rock and not really understanding, you know, kind of who was really leading that, which should have informed, you know, my, my interest in partaking, not knowing that this was, you know, the son of a army general. Um, and just, it was, it just got messy and it just made me think about a moment because, you know, I boarded a bus with, 40 or so other folks from Florida. We drove all the way up to North Dakota. Um, on one hand, it, it felt like standing in solidarity. On the other hand, it felt like we also brought a lot of negative attention and in certain aspects, we caused more harm than, than good. Um, and it felt like a, a moment versus a movement. You know, folks kind of showed up, you know, were there and then went home and went about their daily lives. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you maybe if you could maybe share how folks can in, in their own communities um, advocate, engage, uh, uh, or, or do any kind of community building work with the native community uh, in, in their area. Yeah, and, and I, I always appreciate people to center the people in your area. You don't have to go that far. Um, this might sound controversial, and I say this often, and it's not even to shock anyone, but, uh, and this is not directed at you at all, but I ask, uh, especially white people in particular, but those who want to be allies to Native peoples, one, did they ask for your allyship? 
right? It's a simple question. It might be even considered rude or direct, but did they ask? Because if we truly respect uh, indigenous sovereignty, which can also be hetero, hetero uh, patriarchal, can be anti-black in different contexts. Uh, I know that might also sound controversial, but certainly it can. It can also uphold capitalism. I know people don't like to go there, but various forms of what is called tribal sovereignty ain't it. Um, because it's not really critiquing power at all, and it just normalizes the settler state in a certain way. Not the most radical parts of them, but but some of them. Um, and so did they ask for the kind of assistance? And then, you know, is someone willing to do the things that they're asking or that Native people are asking of you? Right. That might mean being good solidarity. That might mean going to ceremonies. It could mean a host of things that don't seem like very active per se, but they're significant and important. Now we got to the good stuff right here at the end. Thank you so much <laughs> with laying that down, Kyle. Really beautiful work. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and analysis with us. Anthony, thank you for holding it down with this moderation. I want to thank everybody who joined us today for this conversation. This was the second in a seven-part series called Surviving the Long Wars. Please stay tuned for more. Join us in November with Professor Lale Khalili, um, all the way from London, who will be joining us on November 10th. And until then, we're wishing you all well and uh, continue freedom dreaming. Thank you so much.